Section 4 of Library of World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by J. Martin. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 4, The Shadow on the Wall, Part 2, by Mary Eleanor Wilkins Freeman. Suddenly, Mrs. Brigham, as she sewed, glanced at the opposite wall. The glance became a steady stare. She looked intently, her work suspended in her hands. Then she looked away again and took a few more stitches. Then she looked again and again turned to her task. At last she laid her work in her lap and stared concentratedly. She looked from the wall around the roof, taking note of the various objects. She looked at the wall long and intently. Then she turned to her sisters. "'What is that?' she said. "'What?' asked Caroline harshly. Her pen scratched loudly across the paper. Rebecca gave one of her convulsive gasps. "'That strange shadow on the wall,' replied Mrs. Bickham. Rebecca sat with her face hidden. Caroline dipped her pen in the inkstand. "'Why don't you turn around and look?' asked Mrs. Bigham in a wondering and somewhat aggrieved way. "'I am in a hurry to finish this letter. If Mrs. Wilson Ebbett is going to get word in time to come to the funeral,' replied Caroline shortly. Mrs. Brigham rose, her work slipping to the floor, and she began walking around the room, moving various articles of furniture, with her eyes on the shadow. Then suddenly she shrieked out, Look at this awful shadow! What is it, Carolyn? Look! Look! Rebecca, look! What is it? All Mrs. Brigham's triumphant placidity was gone. Her handsome face was livid with horror. She stood stiffly, pointing at the shadow. Look! she said, pointing her finger at it. Look! What is it? Then Rebecca burst out in a wild wail after a shuddering glance at the wall. Oh, Carolyn, there it is again! There it is again! Carolyn Glenn, you look, said Mrs. Brigham. Look, what is that dreadful shadow? Carolyn rose, turned, and stood confronting the wall. How should I know, she said. It has been there every night since he died, cried Rebecca. Every night? Yes, he died Thursday. This is Saturday. That makes three nights, said Carolyn rigidly. She stood as if holding herself calm with a vice of con concentrated will. It... It looks like, like, stammered Mrs. Brigham in a tone of intense horror. I know what it looks like well enough, said Carolyn. I've got eyes in my head. It looks like Edward, burst out Rebecca in a sort of frenzy of fear only. Yes, it does, said Mrs. Brigham, whose horror-stricken tone matched her sister's. Only, oh, it's awful. What is it, Carolyn? I ask you again, how should I know? replied Carolyn. I see it there like you. How should I know any more than you? It must be something in the room, said Mrs. Brigham, staring wildly around. We've moved everything in the room the first night it came, said Rebecca. It's not anything in the room. Carolyn turned upon her with a sort of fury. Of course it's something in the room, she said. How you act! What do you mean by talking so? Of course it is something in the room. Of course it is, agreed Mrs. Brigham, looking at Carolyn suspiciously. Of course it must be. It is only a coincidence. It just happens so. Perhaps it is that fold of the window curtain that makes it. It must be something in the room. It's not anything in the room, repeated Be Rebecca with obstinate horror. The door suddenly opened, and Henry Glenn entered. He began to speak, then his eyes followed the direction of the others. He stood stock still, staring at the shadow on the wall. It was life-size and stretched across the white parallelogram of a door, half across the wall space on which the picture hung. "'What is that?' he demanded in a strange voice. "'It must be due to something in the room,' Mrs. Brigham said faintly. It's not due to anything in the room, said Rebecca again with a shrill intensity of terror. How you act, Rebecca Glenn, said Carolyn. 
Henry Glenn stood and stared a moment longer. His face showed a gamut of emotions, horror, conviction, then furious incredulity. Suddenly he began hastening hither and thither about the room. He moved the furniture with fierce jerks, turning ever to see the effect upon the shadow on the wall. Not a line of its terrible outlines wavered. "'It must be something in the room,' he declared in a voice which seemed to snap like a lash. His face changed. The inmost secrecy of his nature seemed evident until one almost lost sight of his lineaments. Rebecca stood close to her sofa, regarding him with woeful, fascinated eyes. Mrs. Brigham clutched Carolyn's hand. They both stood in a corner out of the way. For a few moments he raged about the room like a caged, wild animal. He moved every piece of furniture. When the moving of a piece did not affect the shadow, he flung it to the floor, his sisters watching. Then suddenly he desisted. He laughed and began straightening the furniture which he had flung down. "'What an absurdity,' he said easily. "'Such a to-do about a shadow.' "'That's so,' assented Mrs. Brigham in a scared voice, which she tried to make natural. As she spoke, she lifted a chair near her. "'I think you have broken the chair that Edward was so fond of,' said Caroline. Terror and wrath were struggling for expression on her face. Her mouth was set, her eyes shrinking. Henry lifted the chair with a show of anxiety. "'Just as good as ever,' he said pleasantly. He laughed again, looking at his sisters. "'Did I scare you?' he said. "'I should think you might be used to me by this time. You know my way of wanting to leap to the bottom of a mystery, and that shadow does look queer-like. And I thought if there was any way of accounting for it, I would like to do it without any delay. You don't seem to have succeeded, remarked Caroline dryly with a slight glance at the wall. Henry's eyes followed hers, and he quivered perceptibly. Oh, there is no accounting for shadows, he said, and he laughed again. A man is a fool to try to account for shadows. Then the supper bell rang, and they all left the room, but Henry kept his back to the wall, as did, indeed, the others. Mrs. Brigham pressed close to Carolyn as she crossed the hall. "'It looks like a demon,' she breathed in her ear. Henry led the way with an alert motion like a boy. Rebecca brought up the rear. She could scarcely walk. Her knees trembled so. "'I can't sit in that room again this evening,' she whispered to Carolyn after supper. "'Very well, we'll sit in the south room,' replied Caroline. "'I think we will sit in the south parlor,' she said aloud. "'It isn't as damp as the study, and I have a cold.' So they all sat in the south room with their sewing. Henry read the newspaper, his chair drawn close to the lamp on the table. About nine o'clock he rose abruptly and crossed the hall to the study. The three sisters looked at one another. Mrs. Brigham rose folded her rustling skirts compactly around her, and began tiptoeing toward the door. "'What are you going to do?' inquired Rebecca agitatedly. "'I am going to see what he is about,' replied Mrs. Brigham cautiously. She pointed, as she spoke, to the study door across the hall. It was ajar. Henry had striven to pull it together behind him, but it had somehow swollen beyond the limit with curious speed. It was still ajar, and a streak of light showed from top to bottom. The hall lamp was not lit. "'You had better stay where you are,' said Carolyn, with guarded sharpness. "'I'm going to see,' repeated Mrs. Brigham firmly. Then she folded her skirt so tightly that her bulk, with its swelling curves, was revealed in a black silk sheath. She went with a slow toddle across the hall to the study door. She stood there, her eye at the crack. In the south room, Rebecca stopped sewing and sat watching with dilated eyes. Carolyn sewed steadily. What Mrs. Brigham, standing at the crack in the study door, saw was this. Henry Glenn, evidently reasoning that the source of the strange shadow must be between the table on which the lamp stood and the wall, was making systematic passes and thrusts all over and through the intervening space with an old sword which had belonged to his father. Not an inch was left unpierced. 
he seemed to have divided the space into mathematical sections. He brandished the sword with a sort of cold fury and calculation. The blade gave out flashes of light. The shadow remained unmoved. Mrs. Brigham, watching, felt herself cold with horror. Finally Henry ceased and stood with the sword in hand and raised as if to strike, surveying the shadow on the wall threateningly. Mrs. Brigham toddled back across the hall and shut the south room door behind her before she related what she had seen. "'He looks like a demon,' she said again. "'Have you got any of that old wine in the house, Carolyn? I don't feel as if I could stand much more.' Indeed, she looked overcome. Her handsome, placid face was worn and strained and pale. "'Yes, there's plenty,' said Carolyn. "'You can have some when you go to bed.' "'I think we had all better take some,' said Mrs. Brigham. "'Oh, my God, Carolyn, what?' "'Don't ask and don't speak,' said Carolyn. "'No, I, I'm not going to,' replied Mrs. Brigham. "'But,' Rebecca moaned aloud. "'What are you doing that for?' asked Carolyn harshly. "'Poor Edward,' returned Rebecca. "'That is all you have to groan for, said Carolyn. "'There is nothing else.' "'I am going to bed,' said Mrs. Brigham. "'I shan't be able to be at the funeral if I don't.' Soon the three sisters went to their chambers, and the south parlor was deserted. Carolyn called to Henry in the study to put out the light before he came upstairs. They had been gone about an hour when he came into the room bringing the lamp which had stood in the study. He set it down on the table and waited a few minutes, pacing up and down. His face was terrible. His fair complexion showed livid. His blue eyes seemed dark blanks of awful reflections. Then he took the lamp up and returned to the library. He set the lamp on the center table, and the shadow sprang out on the wall. Again he studied the furniture and moved it about, but deliberately, with none of his former frenzy. Nothing affected the shadow. Then he returned to the south room with the lamp and again waited. Again he returned to the study and placed the lamp on the table, and the shadow sprang out from the wall. It was midnight before he went upstairs. Mrs. Brigham and the other sisters, who could not sleep, heard him. The next day was the funeral. That evening the family sat in the south room. Some relatives were with them. Nobody entered the study until Henry carried a lamp in there after the others had retired for the night. He saw again the shadow on the wall leap to an awful life before the light. The next morning at breakfast Henry Glenham announced that he had to go to the city for three days. The sisters looked at him with surprise. He very seldom left home, and just now his practice had been neglected on account of Edward's death. He was a physician. "'How can you leave your patients now?' asked Mrs. Brigham wonderingly. "'I don't know how to, but there is no other way,' replied Henry easily. "'I have had a telegram from Dr. Mitford.' "'Consultation?' inquired Mrs. Brigham. "'I have business,' replied Henry. "'Dr. Mitford was an old classmate of his.' who lived in a neighboring city and who occasionally called upon him in the case of a consultation. After he had gone, Mrs. Brigham said to Carolyn that, after all, Henry had not said that he was going to consult with Dr. Midford, and she thought it very strange. "'Everything is very strange,' said Rebecca with a shudder. "'What do you mean?' inquired Carolyn sharply. "'Nothing,' replied Rebecca. Nobody entered the library that day, nor the next, nor the next. The third day, Henry was expected home, but he did not arrive, and the last train from the city had come. "'I call it pretty queer work,' said Mrs. Brigham. "'The idea of a doctor leaving his patients for three days, anyhow, at such a time as this, and I know he has some very sick ones. He said so. And the idea of a consultation lasting three days?' There is no sense in it, and now he has not come. I don't understand it for my part. I don't either, said Rebecca. They were all in the south parlor. There was no light in the study opposite, and the door was ajar. Presently Mrs. Brigham rose. She could not have told why. Something seemed to impel her, some will outside her own. 
she went out of the room again wrapping her rustling skirts around that she might pass noiselessly and began pushing at the swollen door of the study she has not got any lamp said rebecca in a shaking voice caroline who was writing letters rose again took a lamp there were two in the room and followed her sister rebecca had risen but she stood trembling not venturing to follow the doorbell rang but the others did not hear it it was on the south door on the other side of the house from the study rebecca after hesitating until the bell rang the second time went to the door she remembered that the servant was out caroline and her sister emma entered the study caroline set the lamp on the table they looked at the wall oh my god gasped mrs brigham there are there are two shadows the sisters stood clutching each other staring at the awful things on the wall then rebecca came in staggering with a telegram in her hand here is a telegram henry is dead end of section four recorded by j martin 